rough week for the banking industry. The collapse of Silicon Valley Bank is causing shockwaves across the entire business world. A big bank just died. We've all heard about it. Everyone's talking about it. And we got to talk about it because something big is going on here. As of this morning, Silicon Valley Bank, or SVB, has gone under completely. The second biggest bank collapse in U.S. history. The bank is called the Silicon Valley Bank, or we're going to call it SVB in this video. It is the epicenter of tech startups, venture capital. And it is now effectively dead. The government is scrambling to keep us all calm while this bank fails. Your deposits will be there when you need them. The American banking system is really safe and well capitalized. That's because we live in a system that doesn't work if everyone freaks out at the same time. <laughs> the system relies on all of us keeping a feeling of safety. If that doesn't happen, the system falls apart. And that's what I'm going to explain today. So let me show you how this happened, how this bank failed, and what it means for you and me. But more importantly, how this moment teaches us that our bank accounts are kind of a lie. We're going to have to do something different here. We're actually rescuing depositors in banks that made some bad decisions over the course of the last year or so. America can have confidence that the banking system is safe. Okay, so let's talk about banks. All this is done with credit. Credit created by the bank out of the deposits made by all of us. Banks are actually pretty nuts. We think of a bank as like a place where we take our money and store it. Like we give our money to the bank people and they go put it in a giant vault and it is safe until we need it. But that is not what is happening. In reality, banks are doing something pretty magical when you give them your money. What they do is actually at the heart of our modern society, our modern economy. It's what makes a lot of things work. Let me explain. Well, let's get a little bit more insight on the collapse of Silicon Valley Bank. Okay, for this, let's get back to the old collage of the macro economy as we've done in previous videos. Let's say I put $10,000 into my bank. What's insane is that the bank only has to keep 10% of that money in the actual bank. 10%. So that's like $1,000 of my $10,000. The other $9,000 they can go out and invest with and make money on. Using my money, they can go invest it. This often means giving out loans to people and collecting interests. Okay, so 9,000 of my dollars gets loaned out to, let's say, a baguette business who is in need of a business loan because they need a new oven. My bank gives the baker my money and charges interest on that loan. And they actually give me a little bit of that interest that they've made to say like, hey, thanks for letting me use your $9,000. So the baguette business now has 9,000 of my dollars. And I don't actually know this because I kind of think that my money is in a vault somewhere. So now the baker with his new loan goes and buys his oven for $9,000. And the oven seller takes that $9,000 and goes and puts it in their bank. And guess what? Their bank does the exact same thing that my bank did with my money. But now they're doing it with their money, which is kind of my money. They only have to keep 10% in their vault. So they only have to put $900 in the vault but now they've got $8,100 that they can lend out. And look, there's a family who's looking to spend money on a home and they need a loan. Okay, wait, are you seeing what's happening here? I gave 10 grand to my bank and now that money has magically duplicated a few times to make more money, like real money that can be used to buy things, an oven and then a house. This continues to happen over and over and over. My 10 grand just keeps getting used to be lent out, put into another bank, and then lent out again. In fact, if you model this out in a nerdy spreadsheet, which is something I like to do, you'll see that if I deposited $10,000 in the bank, $10,000 is added to the system. But then for each one of these transactions, more and more money gets added to the system. This is the aggregate of all of the money being added to the system. My $10,000 turns into this. Look what happens. Look, it just keeps going and going and eventually, it effectively 10Xs, it sort of flatlines out at $100,000. What? My $10,000 just turned into $100,000 into the economy because of weird mental constructs? Yes, that is our modern financial system. It is amazing and it's kind of mind blowing. Okay. This magical thing is called the money multiplier effect and it relies on the reserve ratio, the, the requirement that banks have, like the amount that they have to keep in, in this case 10%, which is like the real reserve ratio right now. You can do this calculation, it's like one over the reserve ratio and it sort of gives you this multiplier effect of your money. The crazy thing is, 
the lower the reserve ratio, like if your bank only had to keep 5% of your money in, the more money would be created out in the economy, but the riskier that would be for you. If the reserve ratio was like 50%, if they had to keep 50% of your money, then like that's safer for you. But now you're not like priming the pump of like giving all of this money to the economy to like make transactions and build businesses and build capitalism. So the reserve ratio is like 10% right now, which means that a bank that has $100 million from all of its customers really only has to have $10 million in its vault at all times. And the other 90 million is out doing its work in the economy, multiplying itself and making a return for the bank and giving you a little interest rate. And the bank is secretly the whole time like, please everyone don't come withdraw your money at the same time because we don't actually have it. Just please, thanks. Okay, so this is slightly scary, right? Like the bank only has 10% of my money? feels kind of risky. I thought banks were like the safest place to put your money. It's not like I'm doing some hardcore, like risky stock investing. Maybe I should take all my money out of my bank account and put it under my mattress so that the bank isn't like playing around with it. Well, no, let's actually not do that, please. Because if we did, our economy would miss out on this amazing, magical multiplier effect that turns my 10 grand into 100 grand. And our economy would literally be a fraction as prosperous as it is. The reality is we don't have to worry. And I'm going to explain that to you in a sec, but I first need to thank the sponsor of today's video. Thanks to today's sponsor, Incogni. Some of you may have remembered that a few years ago I made a video about junk mail, and like the original framing of that video was I was going to go on a war on junk mail. I was going to try to unsubscribe from everything and see if I could rid my life of junk mail. Unfortunately, the video turned into just an explainer about how my data is bought and sold, and I gave up on the whole unsubscribe from all of the junk in this world. Why? because it was impossible. Many of us don't know that our data, our personal information, is packaged and sold on an open market in this shadowy industry of data brokers. And not just like one or two data brokers, hundreds. This is a very lucrative industry. The bad news is navigating the system to successfully extricate yourself from it is really difficult. It's incredibly tedious by design. It would literally take years. This is where Incogni comes in. Incogni is a service that you give permission to go out and remove you from all of these lists to get you out of this system. It's not an easy process. Trust me, I tried it. But Incogni is set up to do this. They reach out to data brokers on your behalf and request that your information be removed. And then they deal with the aftermath if they run into any issues. With their yearly subscription, Incogni consistently is monitoring for you, protecting your data and making sure that you don't end up back in this system. It's actually been pretty fascinating for me to look at the dashboard in Incogni. I've been looking and realizing that I'm on over a hundred of these lists which explains why my email inbox is like a disaster and why my phone is ringing all day from like random robocalls. But it's also personal safety. Like you don't want someone knowing where you live and what you're up to. It's just like, get me out of this system. So I created an account and then gave Incogni permission, just like with a click. And now here they're off to the thing. They've sent out 148 requests to data brokers. I've already been removed off of 33 of these lists. I can't tell you how satisfying this is. I finally have a tool to fight back against this shadowy industry. So the first 100 people to click the link in my description get 60% off using this service. It is incognito.com slash Johnny Harris. Make sure to use the code Johnny Harris. Helps support this channel. Also get you in on the deal. Thank you, Incogni, for sponsoring this video and for existing. I'm very appreciative. Let's get back to the video. Okay, so banks only hold on to 10% of my money and the other 90% they are investing in the world. And this is kind of scary. Governments know that this is kind of scary. And they also know that our society and our economy is built on us keeping our money in the bank not freaking out, not everyone all of a sudden going and pulling it out. So to make us all sleep better at night, they promise that if a bank ever does anything reckless with our money or they accidentally lose it while they're out there investing, that the government will make up the difference, that the government will pay us back for any money that we lost, at least up to $250,000. It's kind of like a everyone stay calm, we'll pay you back if you lose it, just don't everyone go at the same time and pull out your money, please. The whole system relies on it. Can we just chill? And we can chill as long as we don't have more than $250,000 in our bank account. Anyway, this is kind of works for most people. Most people don't have $250,000 lying around. But what about businesses? Businesses have to use banks. They have expenses every month like payroll and rent. A tech company like Roku had $500 million in Silicon Valley Bank. And at this time, the company does not know to what extent they'll be able to recover that cash. Companies like this need way more than $250,000 to cover their costs. So the question is, 
How do they feel safe? And this is where we get back to Silicon Valley Bank. These dynamics become very strange when you're talking about the customers being a bunch of businesses. Do you have money jitters? Ask your nearest Bank of America branch for a jar of soothing instant money. Okay, so Silicon Valley Bank is the bank for businesses, particularly tech startups in California. And unsurprisingly, 90% of their customers had more than the $250,000 sort of mark where the government will insure you. So a lot of that money is not insured by anyone. They just trust their bank. And that's fine. Banks aren't out there taking their customers' money and like, making super risky bets with it. This bank has been operating for 40 years and it's been doing just fine. But what happens next is a perfect storm of events that led this bank to sink. Where is he? Peekaboo. Let's make a list for this. Here we go. The anatomy of a collapse of a big bank. First, they invested a lot of their customers' money, like every bank does. In this case, they invested in government bonds, which is a totally safe investment. It's an investment you put your money in for a certain amount of time, like 10 years, and the government will pay you interest on that money based on the federal interest rate. The interest rate, you know, the thing that the Fed puts up and down to sort of help put brakes on the economy. The thing is though, when SVB bought these bonds, it was like last year and the year before, back when rates were very, very low. Okay, not a great return for them, but it was fine. It was a safe investment. If they just waited out the time period of the bond, they would get all their money back plus a little return. Okay, but then what happens next? Economists expect a rate hike of three quarters of a percent to help drive down inflation. The government starts to raise interest rates. They're doing this to help stave off inflation, stabilize the economy. The government is doing this thing called raising interest rates. That's fine. But what it means is that people buying bonds today are gonna get a better rate of return. Those bonds are more valuable now, today. So SVB, who bought their bonds a couple years ago when interest rates were super low, and if they ever wanted to sell those bonds early, they're now competing with interest rates that are a lot higher, and so their bonds are actually worth much less. If they had to sell them today, they would lose money. Okay, but again, that's fine. Just hold on to your bonds until the, the whole maturity schedule happens, and then the government will give you all your money back with your little return. Everything is okay. Okay, but here's the next part of the perfect storm that really starts to heat all this up. Remember that SVB's customers are startups. Startups raise money from venture funds and they take that money and they deposit it into SVB and that is how SVB gets its money to operate, to invest with. But during this recent economic downturn, startups haven't been able to raise as much money and thus SVB hasn't had as much money coming in the door. And so they start pulling on their reserves and they realize they kind of have to figure out a way to get more money and it's not gonna come from startups because startups aren't raising. So they turn to their bonds. They're like, we've got tons of our customers' money in these really safe bonds. They're at low interest rates. We probably need to sell some of them off to like get some cash in our reserves to like meet all of our needs and the withdrawals and all of that. So they sell off a bunch of their bonds and this is where things start to go really, really wrong. They announce that they're selling their bonds and they have to sell them early. And yes, we bought them at a lower interest rate and now the interest rate is higher. So we're actually selling them at a loss and that loss is actually $2 billion. Okay, like again, banks have to deal with this kind of stuff. This isn't great for them, but it's far from lethal. But then, this is where it starts to get really bad, they go out and announce that they're gonna be raising money from other investors. They're like going out looking for money. They're like, hey, yeah, we sold off the bonds. We also need you guys to invest in our bank so that we can just stay good. Everyone stay calm, it's not a big deal. We just need to raise a little money. <laughs> Everyone stay calm. The best way to like get people to freak out is to be like, stay calm, it's actually not that big of a deal, we're fine. We just need to raise some money and we're selling bonds at a loss. Oh my God, okay, it's happening. Everybody stay calm. What's, What's the procedure, everyone? Calm? everyone? What's the procedure? Stay calm. Okay, so now the moment that deals the final blow to all of this. All of these founders and venture firms, they're all talking to each other because they're all in the same community, in the same area, all in the same business. They're all in the same WhatsApp groups and they're all like, hey guys, uh, what's going on with SVB? All of our bank, why are they raising money? Why are they selling their bonds early? Is my money not safe? And so, like a herd of bison frightened by a loud bang, a stampede of very wealthy founders and startups in Central California start pulling out their money from SVB, trying to stay safe. What you're seeing behind me is customers of Silicon Valley Bank lined up to make sure that they can get their money. They know that their accounts aren't insured by the government because they have way too much money, and so they don't feel like their money is safe. 
and they take it all out. I need money. How am I going to live until the bank opens? I got Dr. Bills to pay. I need cash. I can't I keep my kids on faith. I've got to have How much do you need? On Wednesday alone, customers pulled out $42 billion, which was a quarter of what the bank was worth. Word spreads to Wall Street that this is happening, and SVB's stock begins to tank. The bank stock lost 80% of its value this week, 60% in one day alone, yesterday. Which makes it even harder for them to go out and raise new money to meet all of the demands of people withdrawing, withdrawing, withdrawing their money. There is a panic or as we call it, a run on the bank. And so, just like that, SVB ran out of cash because all of their customers tried to get their money out at the same time and were reminded that the modern banking system is built off of banks only having a fraction of your money, while the rest of it is out in the economy turning into more money. In the proper hands, your money is alive. We don't want to be reminded of this very often, but when we are, it's kind of scary. So the government swoops in to take over the ship. Oh, but not before the bank executives could pay themselves a bunch of bonuses because they're banking people and this is what banking people tend to do. So yes, by Friday, federal regulators stepped in and seized control of SVB's assets. It'll go down as the second largest bank collapse in history, right behind 2008's Washington Mutual meltdown. So since the very beginning of the modern financial system, the government has played an important role in making us feel safe about our bank accounts. Even though our bank accounts are a bunch of mental constructs and really just a list of IOUs plus 10% of your actual money, they don't want us to think that way. Because if we do, chaos happens and the system collapses. You're, you're, you're thinking of this place all wrong as if I had the money back in a safe. I, the, the money's not here. Well, your money's in Joe's house, that's right next to yours, and in the Kennedy house, and Mrs. Maitland's house, and, and a hundred others. So when a bank actually does collapse, they have to go into hyper mode. This is why all the like government people were like working overtime on the weekends. And the first round of intervention, the first thing they need to do is just words. Americans can have confidence that the banking system is safe. Today is about not sinking the boat that we are all in. Like this is really important. They need to say that like the government is there to protect this money. Like you don't need to go panic and take all your money out of the bank. You are fine, you are insured. Because panic spreads like a contagion. You know this feeling, like when you feel a sense of panic, it will just spread. You don't wanna be the last person to act because of it. And we have some cautionary tales. In the 1930s, 9,000 banks failed. There were huge runs on all of these banks. There was no $250,000 insurance. So people got worried and took all their money out at the same time and the whole thing collapsed. In the aftermath of the 2008 financial crisis, 500 banks failed. And if you remember, there were some banks that were so big, that would have been so catastrophic if they failed, that taxpayers came and bailed them out, gave them all the money to make good on all of their needs. This is how important it is. And in this case, the government pulled out all the stops to get everyone their money back. Over the weekend, the Biden administration took extraordinary measures to guarantee anyone who had accounts with the collapsed banks would be able to get back all of their money regardless of the amount. Again, 90% of the customers of SVB had accounts of over $250,000 and they weren't insured. And yet the government was able to give them their money back. Technically, they didn't use taxpayer money to do this. We don't think, we're not sure, but it was actually like a fund that all the banks paid into. So whether or not this is like another bailout, 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 I'm a bailout. bailout. is hotly debated and it will continue to be debated anyway. The big debate that I'm thinking about here is whether or not the government should let banks fail or if they should always swoop in and save them. When you let banks fail, you force them to feel the consequences of their decisions on how they manage their banks. But when you let banks fail, you also create this feeling of anxiety that is contagious. And right now there already is a bit of an economic anxiety flooding around our country. Inflation is high, there's war, there's increased competition with China and trade barriers. People are slightly on edge. And so the government swooped in with 150% of their might to make everyone feel safe. They didn't want to ignite this into another 2008 style meltdown. This was the safer approach. I guess for me, I'm slightly concerned that this may lead to just more reckless risk taking because we're kind of sending a signal to these banks that like, hey, if you fail, even the kind of smaller ones, we will probably bail you out. Which again, is a good thing. This helps quell any chaos. 
especially in the short term. We don't have people freaking out. We have no reason to go run and pull out all of our money now. And importantly, people who have money in small regional banks feel secure. They're not gonna take out all their money and put it in like, banks that are too big to fail. But in the long run, it could just mean banks will feel emboldened to continue with bigger and bigger bets, knowing that the government will bail them out, knowing that there's not real consequences, knowing that they'll get their bonuses. So the debate is heating up now in a new way. You're gonna see a lot of fighting. You're gonna see a lot of Elizabeth Warren, who is very smart on this stuff and also very bullish about regulating banks. There will be another financial crisis. Of course, when the crash comes, the big banks will throw up their hands and say, it's not their fault, nobody could have seen it coming. And then they'll run to Congress and beg for bailout money. And let's be blunt, they'll probably get it. And what happens next is we will witness if this government intervention actually worked, if the government successfully calmed us all down so that the system can keep going, or if this panic will continue to spread, leading to more bank runs, more failed banks, and a stark reminder that our modern financial system is a mental construct that leads us to all work together for the prosperity and growth of our society until, that is, the dominoes start to fall. They knew the taxpayers would bail them out. They weren't being stupid. They just didn't care. Yeah, because they're fucking crooks. But at least we're going to see some of them go to jail. Right? I mean, they're going to have to break up the banks. I don't know. I don't know. I have a feeling that in a few years, people are going to be doing what they always do in the economy tanks. They will be blaming immigrants and poor people.